Great. Well, Laura, thanks so much hey, for making Daniel. time. This is great. Oh, so good to see you. So, um, yeah, thank you for making time for this this conversation and the Voices of the Regeneration series. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that um, I can add you to this growing group of people that, that I've been having these conversations with. And it's such a blessing. Like many of them are, are old friends of yours, like Albert Bates and, and Declan Kennedy. And just recently I had a wonderful conversation with Maddie Harland. Um, so it, it feels like being in, in, a, in a kind of extended council circle uh, um, of, of slowly making my, my way around people that I've learned a lot from. So um, this is really wonderful. And what, what I usually start with is asking people to speak a little bit to the, the journey of finding your calling, of finding, like finding out what you felt called to give to the world, where you felt called to serve, mm. and how that has sort of evolved over um, your wonderful path. Thank you. So as you might notice by what my lovely gray hair, uh, I grew up in the 60s. <laughs> and so in some ways we were thrown into a whole questioning of uh, what's happening in the world, why are we doing the things that we're doing, what's wrong with people that uh, there's all the issues around racism and uh, poverty and all of the things that we protested in the 60s. And I was part of that movement, did a lot of protesting. And at the end of that cycle in my life, I said, I'm going to say it in Spanish because it sounds a lot better. <laughs> Después de la protesta, don, ¿cuál es la propuesta? After the bueno. protest, what is the proposal like? What is it that we really uh, want to work on? And I've always been a person who likes action. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I, did, I had an education of what they call education. I grew up in New York and uh, so... I had a kind of upper middle class upbringing. And of course I went to school and college and graduate school and got a master's degree. But for me, it was always too theoretical. Mm -hmm. So I understood that if we want to really do something in the world and we want to make change, it's not just saying this is wrong. It's saying, how can we do what's right? So I got uh, interested in community and uh, did a lot of exploration in that way. I won't go through all the details around that, but um, that's how I got involved in the Echo Village movement. It was and 1982 is when you started Weiwei? So Weiwei Koito started in 1982, but yeah. I met up with the group that we uh, was the founding of found, who were the founding members of Wei Wei Koet. I met up with them in 1978. I was with my husband <laughs> <laughs> on, <laughs> on a journey with our young son. He was five years old at that time. He was born in Greece. So I did a lot of traveling before that. Uh, and I was on this journey to find the right community for us. Um, we had lived in Israel for a number of years and found that that was a good arrangement for my husband's older children who were um, from a previous marriage. In, in, a, in a kibbutz? Or? In a kibbutz, yeah. yeah. We lived in Mishmar HaEmek and that's another whole story. I was pregnant and <laughs> I got lots of stories <laughs> to tell, but... Um, so we were on this journey and uh, we took the old communities magazine directory, which I don't know if yes, any remember. of you remember that, <laughs> but it was like the first effort to say there are communities all over the US. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we said, okay, we're just gonna go from one to another. We had no cell phones or any, we had a Volkswagen van that we slept in and so on. And eventually we made it to California. We hadn't found yet the right community. We lived in a lot of places. We spent a lot of time in the farm. That's where I met Albert and um, spent time in other communities, but we had never found the right community. And then uh, on Christmas Eve, actually December 24th uh, of 1978, 
eight, yes. Um, we wound up in Ukiah, California and went to see a man who was in the directory. And he said, you ought to go over to this place called Round Mountain Ranch. They have a community there and you might find that place interesting. So we show up at the gate and Alberto Ruz, who you probably yeah. know, uh, he was opening the gate to um, help his was partner <laughs> uh, to go to work at the hotel there where she was working as a chef. And he said, oh yeah, come on in, you know, his friendly attitude. And he gave us the whole tour of Round Mountain Ranch and led us up to the changing room in which all the costumes were gathered. And there was the whole group trying on all their costumes for the Christmas Eve celebration. Oh. <laughs> well, that was right up my style. I loved a party. I still do. But at that time, I was able to do my dancing and all of that. I have a long history doing dancing as well. So um, we they just said, yeah, yeah, come on in and dress up and all of that. And by the morning when the party ended, we said, this is it. This is our community. Yeah. Later, we found out that uh, the people who were there at the time during Christmas vacation were not actual members. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I've gone on quite a long. But, was it, was that, that led to the first caravan. It, I, I was going, yeah. just going to ask, so that's the group you actually were part of the Caravana Aquairus? Um, oh, yeah, I was yeah. part of the first caravan. We were called yeah. the Illuminated Elephants. Uh, yeah. We did <laughs> pure 1970s. I love it. Was Gio there already when around that time or did he join later? Who's that? Gio, Giovanni. Uh, Giovanni also, yeah, he had yeah. been living at another place, uh, another community ranch that was called Greenfield, mm -hmm. and he joined at that time, and uh, we all headed, we decided that we should have our own vehicles, and so my husband and I, we got a, a, a converted school bus, <laughs> Well, we took a old bus and converted it and painted it like an elephant, gray. <laughs> <laughs> and with our five-year-old son, we headed down to Mexico. We were uh, seven vehicles eventually, mm -hmm. and we toured Mexico after crossing the border. Many stories, of course, but crossed the border, toured Mexico as the Illuminated Elephants for two years. And at the end of those two years in Mexico, they have a strange thing, which is called the Sexenio. The Sexenio is the six-year period of the presidential reign. Mm -hmm. At in the last year of the sexenio, uh, all the people in the government know that they cannot be reelected. The government, the president cannot be reelected. And so all of those people who were appointed by the president are now going to have to find other jobs. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, there tends to be a lot of corruption at that point. Mm -hmm. And so finding cultural work was challenging. So that was when um, several people in the group, and then there was also a certain uh, consensio tiredness of all of the travel and what that means, which is not always very easy with children and so on, having to earn income, collect money from people who don't always have your checks ready and so on. So that was when we decided we were gonna find some land. And 1982, um, four people in the group said, uh, okay, we, I think we found the piece of land. And March 6, 1982, we all gathered at this piece of land, which is was called Weiwei Koyoto. That was the Nahuatl name, the old ancient Coyote. And made a ceremony and said, here we are, here we stay. Tierra mi cuerpo, agua mi sangre. And we just... Uh, planted ourselves there and there it was a piece of land with um, some people say nothing on it but that's ridiculous because there were trees and there were uh, plants and flowers and so on uh, there was no road there was no water system but we had a waterfall this is south east of mexico's death yes about about 72 kilometers in the mountains mm -hmm. So it's got actually a wonderful climate. Um, it's not, 
uh, it's about 12 kilometers from Tepoztlan, but it's not as hot in this current rainy, dry, uh, uh, dry unrainy season, uh, which is very hot. Your water situation is good um, with enough water in the rainy season to last all year, or do you get really dry? Uh, well, it depends. <laughs> we have a compost toilet. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. helps a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Some people get trucks of water, pipas. Mm. We almost never have to do that. Um, we store 40,000 liters in the cistern under our house. Mm. So we kind of live on a boat. Mm -hmm. And we have 40,000 liters of water. And with a compost toilet, um, we can, it depends how much you water also yeah. during the dry season and so on. But uh, we, almost ne we almost never, and when the first rains come, we had a little mm -hmm. bit of patter rain the other day, but um, until the rains really come, you don't know how much water you're gonna get in a particular year, but mostly there's an abundance of water. The holding mm -hmm. capacity is really the issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm noticing with um, having been adopted by a piece of land very recently, how instantly um, my old habit of, oh, it's a rainy day, I prefer sunny days, had completely changed. Like, I celebrate <laughs> every gray day. I go, oh, look at this. Like, the gift from the skies is coming. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, that, here, yeah. when it rains, it pours. And yeah. uh, sometimes it can get a little tiring. The houses get humid. Uh, our houses are adobe and stone and wood. We built them out of natural materials, local materials. So the houses can get humid if it rains for two weeks. But that's yeah. unusual. Well, mostly it's wonderful to get the rain. I, I, I just, it just occurred to me to, that you're the perfect question to, uh, the person to ask a question that, um, that I've been sitting with for, for a bit lately in the last, um, like particularly since the pandemic started, you can notice that um, it has kind of maybe um, amplified or maybe started, depending on where we're talking about, a new wave of back to the land. And, and mm. lately I've had a lot of conversations with elders mm. like David mm. Henke and, and so on, who mm. organized the Bioregional Cong um, uh, Congress, North American Bioregional Congress mm. in the eighties. And, and about these different phases where like there was the sixties, seventies hippie first, like when the farm got founded. Um, mm. But I think there was another kind of boom in the 90s when when Jen was founded and you were you were part of all all those meetings mm. um and now it seems like there's a new wave where people want to bring kind of remote working and all the abilities that we now have through online working together with living close to the land and li living um more in a balanced lifestyle where they also have, 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 have their hands on the soil and not just their heads in front of a screen. How do you perceive that with all the students that you've got at Guy, uh, Guy, Guy University? Um, and do you, like, I'm, I'm sort of sensing that there is a danger that that wave isn't really learning from all the lessons that could be extracted from people who've been in the first and second wave of these back to the land movement. And there probably have been many before that. Um, do you yeah. know what I'm getting at? Like this, this Absolutely. Is and I think that you're completely correct. And I've seen this in Gaiu. So um, we, Gaiu was founded uh, 17 years ago, but uh, in fact, we've been operating for 15 years. We took two years to design, talk to our colleagues and say, <laughs> Okay, this may sound like a crazy idea, but our movements need its own university. So um, one of the reasons we founded Guy University as a university is because we think that people need longer term programs. And uh, that's the change that I have seen of late is that we are getting more and more people who want to do our longer term bachelor's or master's or diploma programs, which can be anywhere from, well, one year, but mostly they're like two years or four years or six years, depending on the time that people take to do the programs, because they understand that courses which give them 
nice theory, are really not enough in order to trial out the work that needs to be done with your hands on the land. And so now what I'm seeing is that we're getting more and more people who want to do these longer term programs. We do have shorter programs, certificate courses and so on. But um, there are more people who want to do master's degrees or diploma programs that are longer term because those programs are not theory. Those programs have a little bit of theory, maybe 20% theory, but 80% practice, mentored practice, documented practice, in which people trial out the theories that they were learning and get to evaluate them. What we were talking about before we started the recording. Uh, people need to see what actually works in real time practice. And so they need to do that though with peer support, with uh, global uh, peer support, which is one of the things that also works really well with Zoom, but they need to trial out in real time. And so we're getting more and more people who understand that. They've taken the courses from other uh, organizations, which are great, I'm not putting them down. On the other hand, they understand that a longer period of time where mentors and peers can give them feedback and support and they can document so the collaboration takes place. That's really where we need to go. I mean, since since Guy University's programs have this wonderful flexibility that it's really um, well, student led and then mentor supported in the sense that um, people can basically say, look, my, my project is X and I, in, at the end of my degree, I wanna have achieved this and mm -hmm. I, I wanna take the course and, and turn this journey Yes. Um, into a supported journey by having a mentor and, and also getting a degree for it at the end, which is yes. which is a great opportunity. Yes. Um, have, you, have you noticed that there are more projects that are around that kind of focus of we're trying to start an eco village? Because, like for example, there's this wonder, wonderful uh, group of uh, the, this couple um, that run Future Thinkers. Have you, have you come across them? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're now doing this. Um, regen village kind mm -hmm. of um, yeah. future village uh, yeah. project and I, I just keep thinking how how can we most support those kind of new impulses that are basically the the 2020s version of what you were just describing um, arriving at Weber Kyotl and 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 make doing your ceremony and and, and committing to a piece of land um did do you see a new drive of people? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think you're completely correct. There's a new uh, understanding, especially amongst younger people, mm -hmm. um, the 30s and the 40s. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes the 50s, because there's a transition group that are people who worked in the corporate field um, and now with the pandemic, they're understanding, oh, we can work from home. Oh, that gives us a lot more freedom. Oh, is this really what we want to do? So we're getting a number of people also in that age group of the 50s, for example, but the people in the 30s are, and maybe 40s are often people who say, okay, now I really want to do something. You know, I've maybe tried out some of the dreams I had in the past, but I haven't really been able to achieve that. So what do I need in the way of support? And seeing the uh, way that we can connect now globally, people understand that uh, collaboration and community are just key in terms of being able to actually achieve and mentoring and documentation. And those are the things that we really emphasize in that we call our, our um, pedagogy, we call it transformative action learning. So the transformative has to do with the fact that we need to transform also as human beings. Uh, it's not just a question of what we learn and what we know in the way of content. Yeah. We need to also be able to make those kind of internal 
changes to deal with the oppressions that we have lived with throughout our whole lives and have been kind of superimposed on what was a beautiful, shiny little baby who uh, came into the world with no prejudices around anything. Um, so we use a technique which is called reevaluation counseling. It's an optional technique, but we also offer that course as a way to help people deal with the kinds of oppressions, the peer-to-peer -peer counseling technique, which once you learn it, you don't need to pay for it. Um, you just do it as a free exchange with another person. I counsel you 10 minutes, you counsel me 10 minutes, that kind of thing. Um, and then the action learning, that's such an important piece of it. We have to go into action learning and unlearning because often unlearning is as important or even more important than the learning process like what we can let go of what we need to let go of in order to take in the new information so people are starting to understand that more i think and looking for ways that they can um, harvest this uh, as well as those transition people are, um, as you know, Andrew Langford, my uh, wonderful partner and co-founder of Guy University. He's a permaculture elder. He's a designer. He, um, we got together actually in the Echo Village Designers Education Meeting, uh, in which I said, "Well, what about long term? You know, not just." a course and he said yeah and three people showed up to that little committee meeting he was one described his permaculture diploma design and i said oh that's the design for a university that's really about learning and then we added on learning so permaculture of course is a key issue for us um, because it just if we don't just think about the agricultural aspect of it we can think about the completeness of permaculture mm -hmm. uh, as a system and so any project that anyone wants to do in guy university is self-directed action learning and it needs to fit into the permaculture ethics well that's very broad we know what those are mm -hmm. earth care people care and whatever that third one is, which often is future care. It's a nice one, it rhymes very well. So um, people can uh, design projects with help of their mentors and peer support and feedback and so on that fit into those permaculture ethics. Well, that's really broad. So some people go into social permaculture, some people go into it ecological permaculture, earth care, perma some people try to combine them, some people are uh, very ambitious, they want to uh, become the minister of the environment of Uganda. <laughs> we have we have right now a, a man who's a refugee from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and he's living in a refugee camp in Uganda and he studied permaculture with Morag Gamble who you probably know her and uh, he is teaching the youth in the permaculture in the uh, camp that he's teaching them a permaculture design education he's teaching them all about permaculture they're making gardens there are lots of videos about it and so on and he wants a master's degree why i think he wants a master's degree because he's thinking about the impact that he can have in his country or in uganda uh, in some place in the world. So he's just at the level where he's going into our second certificate course. So we'll see now what his direction is in terms of his projects. But we've had quite a number of people who um, we have one master's graduate, she's running for parliament in Scotland. Uh, oh, <laughs> and uh, she was part of Findhorn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are choosing different paths. And uh, I think many of them feel that because of the university qualification, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's a very different university qualification, our credibility over 15 years has been really high. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is what I've always said, like um, when I remember having conversations with Declan Kennedy when he was involved with Guy University at the beginning, yeah, yeah. Um, like, and, the the proof in, in the in the pudding, so to speak, with these programs is the stories the graduates make with their lives. Yes. And once you've been with it 
for long enough, like which has now happened for, for Guy University and Guy Education, that, that you can see 15 years of, of so of, of graduates, then that tells its own certification and quality control. Like the the way that there, there are actually some universities out there that, that aren't accredited by the um, normal national accrediting bodies. Like, like people don't know that Oxford and Cambridge, for example, don't subscribe to the whole ACCA system of the of the UK. They just say we're Oxford, we're Cambridge. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then in a similar way, Who would question in a much better them? way. Um, the, the, those organizations like like I educate I mean you've had you I know so many amazing people who've gone through programs I mean um Kosher was both a student and a, and a teacher with you um who then became president of the global eco village network and and Gregory Landau um, and Ethan Rowland also worked with you no um absolutely so, they yeah. they um when they graduated, well, during their master's programs, they came across, uh, upon this idea. They developed this idea of the eight forms of capital, mm -hmm. which uh, has kind of gone into the lexicon now. I found it in some kind of news story the other day in which they talked about social capital. And I said, oh, wow, <laughs> I thought that came out of that. Anyway, they wrote a book called Regenerative Enterprise, which has had a very uh, big effect. And now they're working, well, Gregory, they've kind of split in the way in which they're working. Um, but Gregory is working on this whole, I don't, claim to understand it very well i'm sorry but it's whole I, I kind of <laughs> cryptocurrency thing but mm -hmm. i understand the the goal of it and the goal is beautiful which mm -hmm. is people who are doing regenerative agriculture gain currency mm -hmm. by being better and better at doing regenerative agriculture that's what i understand of it yeah, and that's, that's beautiful a great way of summarizing yeah. it <laughs> And, and um, it was because of their book that actually we got that grant from Lush at um, a certain point, uh, Lush, which is that cosmetic company, yeah, which has been Lush. quite, yeah. yeah. Um, so they're uh, what they call North American division, which was based in Canada. They decided that they wanted to take their five, after reading the book by mm -hmm. Gregory um, and Ethan, that they want you to take their five key products and have them be regenerative products. So almonds, almond oil is a key factor in the cosmetic industry. Well, mm -hmm. it just so happened that Andrew and I, at that time, were living in Paso de Robles in, in California. California where lots of almonds are, yeah which used to be the almond, uh, one of the two almond capitals in California. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they asked Gregory and Ethan, well, do you know anyone who knows something about regeneration? And they said, Andrew Langford, Leo Adler, I'm a little bit more on the social part of the whole system and Andrew's on very much into the whole ecological piece. And so that's how we wound up staying in California for about five years, moving to the Cape Bay Valley, which actually was a better place in terms of the potential for the regeneration of the almond industry. And uh, over two years, Andrew developed these varieties of almonds, the permaculture techniques. Uh, they're planted, there are over a thousand trees planted in the farms in California and the Cape Bay Valley. And the last time we went to visit, they're doing really well. So we didn't get to regenerate the whole industry. It's an $11 billion industry. Yeah, it's also a heavy, heavy <laughs> water subsidized industry. I mean, it, it's interesting because there's a dynamic between, like I live on, on an almond island in Mallorca. And, um, okay, yes, right. And, yeah. and the first almonds that made it to California came there by um, the way of, of uh, a Mallorcan um, monk who wow. founded San Luisbo, um, Carmel, um, uh, um, San Francisco, um, Santa Barbara, San Diego. So it, it's a Mallorcan um, yes. friar called yes. um, wow. Juniper Serra, um, okay. who, who f founded most of the, the cities of California. And it's, it's really interesting because I also worked with Lush on, on a regenerative almond project here on Mallorca. And, and here they traditionally grow almonds in dry land. Yeah. And because in California they started irrigating, they basically were able to produce much more and 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 kind of take the global market. And it's interesting dynamic between 
one almond growing area and another. Um, yeah, yes. So. I didn't know that about Mallorca and the person who founded all those cities. I didn't yeah, know it's, it's amazing yeah. to, to think that that a little Mallorcan Freya, I mean, it, it, of course, there's a whole another um, dimension of colonialism and um, of what happened in that process of yeah. um, bringing Christianity to, to California. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, well, that's another theme. <laughs> yeah, that's another but, that's, theme. but that's involved in that whole question of oppression. That I was yeah, and the about. unlearning and the seeing how, and how the unlearning. Um, yes, uh, exactly. Absolutely. No, no. Yeah. It, it, it's really important. I, I, I really deeply appreciate the work that that Guy University has done and how it's evolved over the years as, as well. How many how many students do you normally have in a in a any given year? Um, because they're in different stages. Must be quite yes. almost custom tailored. Uh, like in order to hold people, you have a team of people who've done the masters and like work done a course with you in order to mm -hmm. then be able to be mentors with with you. No, how, yeah. how does it work? So um, I would say we're small but beautiful, <laughs> and that's true. We are small but beautiful, and uh, that has enabled us to be very custom uh customized with our students who we call associates because we're an epistemic learning community so we also learn from our student associates and that's we form what we call an epistemic learning community so um that's a key piece of it so um we take two cohorts a year and the uh, next cohort is actually starting april 8th and so generally in a cohort, there's anywhere from five to 30 people, generally around 20, 25. Um, and that's a cohort of people who are in any of the programs. So they could be bachelors, they could be masters, they could be postmasters, graduate diplomas, diploma. Um, we do an international permaculture design certificate uh, diploma course. And um, they could just be taking that certificate, which is called Eco-Social Design, based on Andrew's book, which is available for even free on Lean Pub. Um, but uh, it's a, a wide mix, global. Um, right now, I would say that cohort's looking uh, about maybe 15, 20 people. Mm -hmm. And we have a second cohort each year. So I would say in a year, we're starting about maybe up to 50 people more or less in GAIU. So that's small. Uh, and people have different interests and people have different countries and different worldviews and different experiences and so on. That certi first certificate course is eight modules, right? And then some of those people continue on into what we call a deep dive program, which would be a bachelor's or a master's. Um, we have a certificate called a certificate in autoethnography and learning design. So that's where people set up their uh, e-portfolios. Mm -hmm. And that's a key piece of GAIU in our opinion because so much good work is being done all over the world. And the documentation is really poor, actually. So the opportunity to share what one is doing with other people in the world and to use that also as part of your career and movement uh, forward, whatever your visions are in your career. So if you wanted to go to a different uh, university and say, this is what I learned and unlearned, you have your e-portfolio. If you want to go into a, another business or an NGO and get a job, you can show your portfolio and say, this is, is what so I learned. Is, is that a, a kind of ecosystem of a website and some social media and, 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 and a YouTube channel or what's, what's an e-portfolio? An e-portfolio is mm -hmm. your own space mm -hmm. on our platform. Mm -hmm. um, so we're developing a, um, we're developing a, a, global, a, a global accreditation system with other people called ICAFs. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the International Coalition for the Accreditation of Future Skills. At least that's the name of, at this point. So it's actually on a platform, which is an ICAFs platform. That's so in is, development. Is, is this... So you develop your e, uh, your e portfolio on mm -hmm. that space. It's your private space, but it's shared with your main advisors. And you asked me about the people who are working in GAIU. So um, we have people who are graduates, 
master's graduates who are then specially trained, specially selected and specially trained to be what we call main advisors for our master's, bachelor's, master's and diploma uh, candidates. So as people are going through the action learning piece of their program, which is the project-based action learning piece, um, they get mentoring and they get feedback and they have to document their work. And that's what the portfolio is. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just so this is this is already leading into something that I also wanted to ask you about this the new developing the meant that you, that you and Andy are involved with and also Andy Goldring of these um, this token system that basically enables the way I understand it um, from the last time we talked about it um, people to design their own degrees and take courses from different providers all around yes. the world and then have them all sort of interoperable in order to create a portfolio that says, look, I might not have done a conventional bachelor's and a conventional master's, but I spent five years traveling the world, lived in different countries, learned a bunch of languages, did the course with Guy University, did a PDC, did an NVC, nonviolent communication course, learned sociocracy, and Guy Education, uh, Guy University has collected all of that and, and given me a a degree is how is how is that vision okay so going? yes it's it's all based on um what's called the open badge system and that's yeah. a system we did not design that and develop that ourselves um open university in the uk for example uses an open badge system mm -hmm. but we understood that we needed in our fields our own open badge system um, because we had a particular interest we're not so interested in some of the topics that people are getting badges for. We're interested in people getting badges for the kind of things that you have just mentioned, right? Uh, and it's in development. It's a challenging project and um, it hasn't, it's received some support from different organizations. Andy Goldring has been really interested in it. And um, there's the Permaculture Collab has been involved in it and so on. Uh, and Andrew has been taking a lot of leadership in it because he's already worked a lot on the design of it. And uh, in the future, when it is clear how this will be launched and so on, that's the point of it. And that will be a, a key part of this international coalition for the accreditation of future skills, because these are the future skills that we need, yeah, the kind of absolutely. things that you have mentioned. Yeah. yeah no, it's it's so important, such important work. And and it, and and it would finally bring that large family of people who've who've basically in different areas provided amazing um leadership in lifelong learning support of people all around the world, whether yes. it's the ULAB community or um, process-oriented psychology or all, all the, they're, they're, they're all little sub-communities that, that actually all teach future skills that, that are really yes. important, just as exactly. much as agroforestry and, and um, agroecology training centers and all, all that. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and I, I think those degrees will be worth so much more than academic degrees because academic degrees are getting more and more out of date. The, the entire process, like the world's moving too fast for the process of accrediting academic degrees um, and getting them certified by the state. And like by the time they get taught, they're three years out of date. Uh, Absolutely. And, and yeah. And no, all the bureaucracy and the trustees and the boards of directors and so on, just yeah. uh, they put a damper on change. Well, uh, also the, the, the internal culture. I mean, that's why I, after, for some reason, probably because of not having been invited to unconditioned cultural learning early enough in my life, I, I had this thing, I need to get a PhD. It was basically my father's influence to some extent in a family of academics. And, yeah. and then getting to the top of that academic or the entry ticket to the academic community of doing your PhD, but, but in the process yeah. realizing how, what I observed at universities was that those people really passionate about their students or really passionate about their work were actually not necessarily the ones that were the successful ones in universities yes. because yes. they they didn't 
go for the career and the big salary of being the dean or whatever because they wanted to actually teach they wanted to they, they were in it with heart and passion and um and and so you you get ego invested politician types running yeah. these institutions and then then like when i was finishing and then trying to get funding for my kind of work which at the time in 2006 none of the funding councils understood because it fell in between the chairs between like social sciences and natural sciences and and economics and they, they, they couldn't really understand what i was trying to do bringing it all together um but even at that time they had this thing in the uk called full inclusive costing and in a nutshell it's basically if you want to do a project that costs a hundred thousand 52,000 of that go to the university from starts in order to pay for the overheads. Uh -huh. <laughs> somehow not the most efficient system. I don't think- No, it somehow it. not. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but, um, I, but before we go, because earlier you mentioned the five pillars of what you're doing right now, and I wanna go there. Um, but I, I, before that, I, I would love to just drill in a little bit more in your, into your story of, so you arrived at where we lived at where but you were more focused on 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 kind of which I, is also something i would love to talk about actually the 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 culturally transformative power of art and performance and music yeah. and dance yeah. because for me that's a big insight over the last few years that i'm realizing no way will we create regenerative cultures without the dancers and the poets and the theater playwrights and and, yeah. and actors coming on board with messaging this and making yes. it real and bringing it into expression in all forms of culture. Um, yes. But what made you, from, from, from being so focused on that with the Caravana Acuiris, um, discover permaculture, it, end up at the Gaia education meetings um, where you met An Andrew and yeah, the, the, the turn, like how did you get interested in education because yeah, so well, when when we bought the, when we bought this land, as I said, there were no buildings or roads even or water systems or anything, and we had to discover um, by doing our uh, due diligence and research what were the kinds of ecological systems that we could put into place. We knew that we didn't. We were two kilometers from the local village. There were no pipes coming in or anything like that. So that got me interested in the whole ecological thing and uh, building a house out of natural building materials and how do we design houses in ways in which we capture water and so on. So that got me very involved in that. Um, and then um, I became part in 1996, we had a new caravan, which was the Caravana Arcoiris for La Paz, which you mentioned previously. And uh, I was on that project for eight years. So I co-coordinated that project during that time with Alberto. And um, what we understood as we traveled through Central and South America was that although people had a large connection to spirituality because of the ancient indigenous wisdom and the ceremonies and that kind of thing, there was very little ecological knowledge. So we wanted to be a theater caravan, but on the other hand, we wanted to pass a message. And so we started to design our theater in a way that it was inspiring and encouraging people to create ecological projects and to uh, get into the ecological learning. So that was an understanding that I uh, gained by going through this eight years of traveling in Central America and then South America and well, I got as far as Peru, but uh, we had done a whole thing into Brazil as well. Uh, I spent 10 months uh, organizing the uh, Call of the Condor event, which was an 800 person gathering near Machu Picchu, which the caravan came in and set up the camp and so on, and was a key part of the uh, the actual event, which lasted for a week. But at the same time, I had organized that the Gen Board and the ENA, which is the Ecovillage Network of the Americas, which I was also by that time on, I was on the International Gen Board and I was on the International 
well, the uh, North American Eco Village Network Board. And I, met, I organized for them to come to that gathering and have their meetings there. So we started to and like kind was, of. Sorry, it, wasn't that also a bioregionally themed gathering? Yes, yeah, so yeah, it was yeah, a bioregional yeah. themed event. Yeah. And uh, so we had people from all movements. And that's another key piece that I have always been uh, pushing for that um, we have. A, Echo Village movements. We have Echoversities, which is a movement that Andrew and I started with another couple, Kelly Timon, Timi, and Udel, Udi Mandel, um, who were professors in England and went around the world trying to find some Ecoversities as opposed to the university they worked in. And we met and we said, no, we need a whole movement. So there's um, that's grown. Manish Jain, who's at Swaraj, he's been a key person in all of that. So um, Echo Villages, Ecoversities, Bioregionalism, Permaculture, uh, indigenous movements and so on. We have all these fantastic movements who, which have been by and large compartmentalized. And one of the things that I have always understood is that the bioregional movement, which understood that any bioregion contains many different movements and many different people with different interests and so on, that's the way we need to get people together. And we need to be collaborating amongst our movements and not being so compartmentalized. So right now I've been on the board of the Permaculture Institute of North America and Echoversities Movement and uh, Gen Elder and the Gen North America and so on. And a lot of the thinking that I have tried to uh, incorporate into my work with these different movements is the recognition that our movements need to be more collaborative and cooperative with each other. This is, this is, you've just described the essence of like the narrative shift that I think would powerfully position what has happened over the last 60 years as the building of a stream that we're now already in the middle of. Like there's, there's this, there's this self mutilating narrative going on in our movement that we now need to start to make the big change rather than yes. looking talking to somebody like you i'm kind of going what <laughs> me. she's been at it for 60 years <laughs> and, and so, um, so so but 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 not it's it's not only i mean of course that is equally important a question of honoring the elders which is part of why i'm doing this voices of the regeneration series yeah. and, and and the youngers because i also want to be them part of it but um but it's it's remembering our roots and remembering that we've been building capacity for a very long time as people as as an as a network and for, for me um when I speak about regenerative cultures, all the movements you just named, and a lot of others like Michael Bowen's attempts with 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 the whole um, peer to peer movement, and and there's lots of other um, yes. mo movements that, for, for me, they're just blossoms or or buds of regenerative culture. And yes. and yes. what what's now happening is that the, these need to find they need to see each other as part of that larger narrative, yes. and. And we need to understand we're we're more than halfway there, <laughs> like <laughs> we're, we've we've already got a good track record, and and we're like the, because the hospicing of the old system is coming to a point where it's clearly like where we're we're going into terminal goodbyes, um, and and there at the same time the midwifing of the new has also matured. Um, mm. it, what I've seen in so many elders, many of them that you mentioned just now. Um, is a shift from, from a little bit activist of and creating others, like an othering of the mainstream and othering of whatever is out there, to, to really being um, compassionate with the old system and trying to build bridges and make as easy as possible for people to enter this new narrative and, and practice. It, like these, these, these anti-edges, I think people have learned to, to let go of and, and be more inviting and more um, uniting. And, and that I think is, 
is vital for us to make this next step. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not there are some people who are on the conversion track mm -hmm. of like, you know, let's take the old universities and convert them and make them better. And I'm not on that track. I'm more on the Buckminster Fuller, build a better model and make the old one obsolete. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you're absolutely right that um, we are on a track now that is not so much anti, though mm -hmm. sometimes it's important, like the people from yeah. Deep Adaptation who point out some of the things that are, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe not that we're not even aware of. The other day, I read an article about how the sperm count uh, of the human population is going down to the point where in 2045, there is the vision that we may not be able to reproduce anymore as a human species. Well, that's a wow. You know, that's like a wake up call. And sometimes we need those wake up calls. But basically, my uh, thinking is that we need to be on this action pathway. Mm -hmm. And we need to be on this, how can we make whatever systems we are putting into place to replace old systems stronger, more effective, more efficient. Uh, Andrew and I talk a lot about competence and attention as being two key measures of uh, how we're doing. Uh, if we don't have both, we're not doing it well. Uh, we're not doing it effectively. We need both the competence, but if we don't have the attention, we might have the competence, we might be really good at it, but if we're not putting attention to it, it's not going to work. And if we don't have the competence, but we're putting a lot of attention to it, that's also not going to work. So we need the both um, pieces of it. And uh, as we move forward, we need to develop more and more competence and attention. And attention is a really, uh, it's an important concept for me because attention for me is like love. So, you know, many people ask like, how is Guy you? Uh, with spirituality. And yeah, we recognize it's all connected, you know, and love is like, oh, now the lighting is changing. <laughs> well, we'll leave it for a while. I think we're maybe, um, what's our timing? How are we doing? Uh, should, should I quick, do you want to draw the curtain and I'll, I'll post Okay, it, very good. Yeah. Okay. okay, we're going. We'll get a little lighting on. Yeah. Okay. How's that? That's yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, attention, like um, we do a we do a little exercise, which we call think and listens. And we do them. We have these Gaia radio calls, which are free calls. You've been on them. And we do what we call a breakout group in which we have people get to speak, not in conversation, but get to think their thoughts and express them yeah, if they like yeah. um, and think and listen. And uh, the other people, though, are just as important as the one who's speaking because they are giving what we call loving attention. Mm -hmm. And when you give attention to people and to topics and to projects, it's like food. It nourishes them. And so it's like that soil that we were talking about, that if you nourish the soil, then the plants grow, then the trees grow, and everything grows in a much more powerful and fruitful way. So we understand that whole vision of the planet, maybe the universe, is all connected. And yet we do not go into any of the compartmentalization of how we practice that understanding. And so it's like an underlying theme in Gaia University. And that's why our colors and our website are not green and brown, which is what many of the people who do ecological work think that that's a way to show. But they're using the spiral dynamics, which uh, I don't know if you know about spiral dynamics. Um, so the second tier, um, which is coral and turquoise and those kind of colors. And that's the way in which we show that kind of underlying spiritual understanding that we have in Gaiyu that then gets translated into transformative action learning that is documented and which is applied. So not just theory, but let's do it. One, one thing that would actually I just realized would be really lovely to hear you speak about because I, I'll, I'll start giving you my version and then you can correct me because um, having worked with guy education for so many years and I mean, people still get the two of them mixed up. 
and, yes. and, then people, <laughs> and, and, and people and people also um, know that they were somehow related and then they're not quite and 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 so I understand so you were just talking about where you met Andrew and in these these meetings when between 19 what was 1960 in 1998 and 2005 um a series of meetings happened that they were fu funded by Gaia Trust um of, of educators from eco villages that were basically pulling together the the curriculum that then Chris Mayer wrote up as the the, the first Gaia education mandala wheel yeah. Yeah? and um the way i tell the story when somebody asked me and i would love for you to correct me if, if i've got this wrong is that at some point i mean hildo always had this dream of one day maybe we we will be ready to have a university and she she tells it like the way i heard her, her tell the story was that gaia university as a name came to her in a dream while while they were working on the Gaia education pro project and then you and and Andy basically decided that that what you were just saying earlier that it wasn't enough to just develop a well, the time was only aimed at being a 125 hour program four week program a bit like the PDC but focused on eco village design education and and that it was actually okay to make the jump and um, and create a university and more long term programs and how like and then i when i started to know get, get to know that tribe so to speak i kind of started to see this dynamic that was there at the beginning between gaia university and and gaia education because of a little bit of hurt on hildo's part that she felt around the name and, and so on but really it's the same route and and you and andrew have significantly contributed to the guy education curriculum as well is, is that roughly correct or how would you tell that story? yeah i would i would say that's roughly correct i think you used a couple of um words that uh, describe what was the motivator for us and mm -hmm. um the eventually mm -hmm. was one motivator uh mm -hmm. And we were part of that uh, EDE curriculum. We were uh, two of the 25 people who were invited to Fintorn to uh, design the Echo Village Designers Education. I was just coming off the caravan project of eight years. I was in Echo, I was at Zeg Echo Village actually. I was teaching at that time facilitation and consensus uh, decision making, which was my topic of import. And um, he was living in Brazier's Park, Echo Village. So we were part of the Echo Village. He was on the European Echo Village uh, network uh, board. I was on the international board, I think, at that time. And so we were very much in favor of Echo Villages, obviously. Um, I was a co-founder of Wewekoetl Echo Village and so on. I had spent a lot of time promoting Echo Villages. And yet at that meeting, I've been a rebel my whole life. And a lot of the people at that meeting were also rebels. But um, I said, look, we have a permaculture design course already. It's a two week course. Yes, I understand. We want to make a longer course. We want to focus on Echo Villages. And in my opinion, we need um, follow up because of that experience of mm -hmm. building an echo village in Mexico. Mm -hmm. You don't build an echo village after taking a one month course. No, you don't. you don't become a permaculture designer after taking a two week course. Mm -hmm. You get inspired to do that. Yeah, exactly. You need help. You need follow up. You need mentoring. You need support. And when I heard about the diploma mm -hmm. system, when so they put a little, you know, committee follow up. Okay. And three people only showed up to that meeting. Everyone else went to economic, social, what they called spiritual at that time, which became worldview, and so on. And three people showed up. That was myself, Andrew Langford, uh, who was called Andy at that time, and uh, Carl Steyert, who was the head of Fintorn College. And when oh, Andrew, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. When Andrew described the diploma program that he had designed for he was the one who brought permaculture to the uk and then he was the one who went around and found all the people who were doing agroforestry and so on brought the first teachers from the outside 
got the first permaculture courses going, was the first permaculture teacher, designed the permaculture diploma, got the Permaculture Association of Britain going with other people as well. Mm -hmm. So um, he was permaculture man, but he was also echo village man. Mm -hmm. Because he originally, described, he was, originally he was a cobbler and then he then he found oh he, uh, he was yeah. he was a shoemaker but yeah. that's another whole story yeah. we'll be on I'll for hours when, when i, when I talk <laughs> with we him. tell all that now. we'll yeah, get him on one story. day <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um so at that little group of three i heard him just uh describe this diploma program mm -hmm. that he had designed and you know, there's certain moments in our life, I don't know if you've experienced them, but we call them Kairos moments, at which you have this epiphany that you have no idea where this comes from. And this is maybe part of my spirituality that sometimes I get this message um, that I have no idea where this comes from. And at that time, I knew I was not going back to the caravan. I was looking for a more global impact project, a project that I thought would have a bigger effect, not just South America, but an effect globally. And it just came to my mind. I said, wow, that's the design for a university that's all about learning. And later we said on learning. We didn't have that as phrase at that time. And I said to him, do you have any interest in making your diploma design into a university that's all about real learning? And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how it all got started, you know, and then we presented it to the group. And um, basically, I think there was a lot of emotional stuff that was going on. As you said, Hilder had that dream and so on. And eventually the group said to us, okay, you want to develop a university as a part of this, do that separately. Mm -hmm. So there were some bad feelings around that. And uh, I feel sorry about that, that that mm -hmm. happened. Uh, I think it was maybe unnecessary, but mm -hmm. everyone has their emotional yeah, investment definitely. in certain things that, um, and then the name was also, I have to say for uh, due diligence that I spent about a month looking for a different name. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I looked for, I knew the vision of what it is that we wanted to do, which was a global university that really dealt with all of the issues that were uh, facing us as a planet, as Gaia. And I love that name, Gaia, because for me, it described the whole thing. But I said, well, to not interfere, let me look for another name. And I found many, many other names, but none of them said it for me. Yeah. And eventually I said to Andrew, um, who we were not together as a couple mm -hmm. at that time, that's a whole other story. But um, I said, I think that that is the one that actually most describes it. Mm -hmm. And there are many Gaias. There were Gaia colleges, there were Gaia yeah, actually, there's, there's businesses, there were many then, Gaias. Yeah. So I felt like there was no one, it wasn't a name that was mm -hmm. trademarked or branded or uh, copyrighted or anything like that. I said, mm -hmm. I really don't think that there is a name that really describes mm -hmm. what we are doing. And I, I feel so, now, I mean, it, it, it did take a while. I, I think it was probably about 10 years where there was the, the air wasn't hundred percent clear. There were the yeah. occasional event. I, I watched a few of them of public making up and we're all friends again, but it wasn't quite <laughs> there yet. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, did we first meet at the Restore the Earth conference at Findhorn when, when the Guy education curriculum was was sort of presented. I'm, I'm trying to remember or where I first. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, not so I'm important. Sorry. Yeah, but, but in terms of you, you, what an amazing story and what an amazing contribution. Um, and you earlier before we started recording, you said you right now you've only got five main projects. Okay, um, I'll tell you about got another twenty <laughs> minutes. Um, <laughs> Share, share what they are with us. Okay, so um, number one, I have to deal with healthcare. Mm -hmm. I have to deal with self-care um, because I, if I did not take care of myself um, and keep my stress down, there's a whole story behind that. I had a uh, 
a benign brain tumor that I made a decision was quite large and I made a decision to have it removed. That was about eight years ago. And as a result, I had convulsions after that because my brain was trying to adjust to having this big empty space where the tumor used to be. So um, I've understood that my convulsions were a result of stress. I haven't had any in now about two and a half years. And I think part of that is my self-care, my decision that I'm going to balance my life in a way that enables me to be as stress-free as possible. That, that is the way that I can do my best work in the world. Okay, that's number one. Number two, uh, relationships. So I have a primary relationship, which is my relationship with Andrew. We work together, we live together, especially now in the pandemic. We're in our little house in Weiwei Koetel, uh, and it's beautiful, and we need to put a lot of attention to that. We use RC, which I've mentioned, reevaluation counseling, as one of the ways in which each of us deals with whatever stresses, emotional things that come up, um, so that we can be in good relationship. We live in a community, so I need to keep good relationships with the people in my community. Often things come up in echo villages and communities. Maybe people know about that. Uh, so we have meetings. We have, I'm a facilitator, so sometimes I have gotten involved in that. Um, and I make every effort to contribute in a positive way to the community and to the building of relationships. Not always easy. I do that with family is another piece of it, and all my colleagues around the world and all the people in Guy University and so on. So relationships, very important um, in one. Third, my house. Houses need maintenance. My house is now, we're in our 39th year at Weiwei Koeto. We're about to celebrate our 40th anniversary next year, which maybe the pandemic will allow us to make a big celebration and you're all invited <laughs> if that happens well. Don't count on that. Uh, <laughs> we have to put that through a community meeting, I think. <laughs> so um, that's another piece of it. Maintaining my physical environment, planting also, um, uh, bringing forth the uh, gardens and the food production and the water retention landscapes and the ecosystem and the uh, whole valley here because we live two kilometers from quite a poor Mexican village, um, rich in many ways and poor in other ways in terms of the economics specifically. Um, and so we are also working to see how we can develop that. So that's in a way part of this whole kind of um, physical maintenance. Of, and are you are you pretty much committed to like this is your place where we're now that like, yeah. you spend time in California and you, you've come back home. Well, now now we are not spending time in California. We have some mm. things stored in California, so mm. we will be going back and see how the trees are doing. But right now we're planted here. What the future? We believe in emergence. <laughs> So I can't tell you what the plan is exactly for the rest of my life, but we have a place here and that's where we're putting all our energy and we're happy with that. And it's our community, um, we feel a part of it and feel a commitment to helping it to maintain and to grow. Okay, so now I've told you the three kind of more personal projects. Yeah. Fourth project is Guy University. I've spoken quite a lot about Guy University. We're in our 15th year. One of our visions for that is succession. Um, I'm 74, Andrew is 71. We're working on that. So uh, you asked about staff. We have a woman in South Africa. She's our outreach and admissions coordinator now. Um, Kelly, who was one of the Echo University founders. She's also working with us. Um, Kyle, who's a Rasta, lives in Portugal. He's doing our, our social media. Um, we have work traders. We have a number of people, as well as all those main advisors who are graduates. So we're looking to see how we can support and develop a team or how that will happen in terms of who will carry on Guy University. Because now, fifth project. So um, because of a Guy University graduate, she earned a diplo international diploma in permaculture design in Guy University. She lives in a West Asian country. 
a country that's suffering from war, from hunger, from poverty, and so on. She had, when she started with Guy Yu, a kind of low-level job in the UNDP in her country. Uh, and Andrew decided that she needed extra support because of many reasons, the uh, situation in her country the potential that he saw in her, the gender inequality that goes on around the world and in, especially in some countries. And so he started mentoring her apart from her main advisor, uh, who is our uh, longest term graduate and main advisor, Jennifer English. And so he was getting up at four in the morning to mentor her because of the time difference. <laughs> Well, she has now become the person in charge of small grants for the UNDP in her country. And so she and Andrew designed what was the dream uh, design for a grant project in that country to train people who are field advisors and field extension agents, who are then the people who train small farmers in regenerative agriculture permaculture techniques and all of those wonderful, new, exciting, and innovative experimental techniques that are being developed all over the world that he is gathering together uh, and other people have worked on as well. So um, that's what, that's our fifth project. So we have a grant now that's a potentially a three-year grant to train the people. There are more than a hundred of these field advisors and extension agents. They're scattered throughout this country. Um, they in turn have their trainees. Um, the facilitators have their trainees and then they in turn have the small farmers that they will be imparting this knowledge to on a contextual basis on a country wide but contextual basis at least in the areas that are not right now in active war. And so. what, what occurs to me is um, I, because you mentioned earlier that you worked with Lush North America, and I, I worked in the last few years quite a bit with Ruth Andrade through um, the Lush Spring Prize. And one of Ruth's other projects was this nurturing, which was initially called the Blueprint Alliance, um, and, and has kind of transformed into um, the Realliance. Um, are, are you aware of them? Because I, I don't know about that particular one. It's, I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you okay. some information. Yeah. Basically what, what their main, it's, it's a wonderfully capable, great group of people from around the world who've done a lot of practical work in, in permaculture type landscape transformation. And yes. um, they're particularly interested in putting that in service into, in, in refuge, refugee situations or kind of, um, recovery from war zones and, and yes. that kind of um, context. And yes. I could imagine that, that that would be a really, like as something like that needs quite a lot of capacity and quite a lot of yes. trainers. Um, yeah. have, yeah. I'll send you the link to their website. It's, yeah. it's just um, real. Well, our, our understanding, you know, this is theoretically a three-year project. Um, we have to ask for approval each year. So we're finishing now before Ramadan, which will be a break. Um, and then there'll be three more sessions after that. So these are four hour training sessions, getting up at four in the morning, <laughs> dealing with the time zone. But um, I do some facilitation. Andrew does the main part of the training. We discuss the needs. We get feedback. We call it takasim, which is a musical form in the Arabic world, um, which means that everything is improvised, innovative, emerging. Mm -hmm. So it's not totally improvised, obviously, because, um, but what it means is we're constantly checking in uh, with the needs of the trainee yeah. mm -hmm. to see how are we doing? Are we meeting the needs? And what we're understanding is that basically what we're giving them is a small farmers permaculture design training course at this point. Mm -hmm. Their basic needs are how do we grow food more efficiently, uh, more effectively? How do we earn a living? How do we make our small farms uh, more 
self-sufficient where we can at least provide for our own food and then earn some money and so on. So we're working on that in this first phase. There will it's hopefully- It's remotely at this point, I assume. All Say again? It. It's all remotely at this point. Uh, oh yeah, everything yeah. is remotely. Yeah. And because of the two countries that Andrew and I are citizens of, we're uh -huh. residents, permanent residents in Mexico, but we're citizens in the US and the UK. Um, we're wow. not allowed to travel to that country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but um, there's a lot that we can do. And there are a lot of people, for example, Chris Evans uh, made a farmer's handbook. He's a permaculture designer. He worked in Nepal for many, it's many that, years. Uh, Luby McNamara's partner. Luby McNamara's yeah, partner. Yeah. Uh, Luby's coming on a guy radio call next yeah. week. So we're doing our best to like, uh, erase these boundaries. I think that that's really important. We can recognize them, but we don't have to actually say, oh, well, we can't cross them. We can like interweave uh, all of these different knowledges and experiences. And so um, everything of course has to be translated into Arabic. So we're working on taking, he's given us permission, thank you very much, Chris, for translating the farmer's handbook, updating it because it was written quite a number of years ago. So we wanna put in the latest technique that Andrew is uh, finding. Chris Mage, small farmer, small farm future, future. I won't mention all of them, but he's been in touch with many people who have been just highly supportive and giving permission for their materials to get translated into Arabic, to become videos. We're putting up a page. We've got all kinds of ideas of how we can reach out into the Arabic world and then use this project as a template for us or other people to be able to do the same kind of work in other countries, which we think is critical. It's the mm -hmm. direction we're going. This small farm future, I think, is where we have to go. Uh, have you um, been tracking the amazing work that this young American guy, Matt Powers, has been. Um, oh, yeah. Um, oh, he's very connected with Matt Powers. And yeah. please say US. <laughs> US yeah. There are yeah. lots of yeah. Americans. Yeah, US yeah. has usurped that name, yeah. but excuse yeah. no, me. <laughs> no, no, it's good, good to be reminded again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's in touch with Matt Powers. He's in touch with many, many people. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what Andrew is doing, Andrew is, from my point of view, I guess I'm uh, perhaps a little prejudiced, but he's just a genius at recognizing the work of other people and bringing it together and finding the connections. And just this last week, he found the connection between the biotic pump and the small white water cycles uh, in the water retention ecosystem regeneration. So uh, <laughs> we're oh, working. Interesting. He needs to tell me about that. When <laughs> you talk to him, that'll yeah. be a topic for talking yeah. to him about. But he said nobody ha that he knows of has actually made that connection. So sometimes he does make those connections. Mm -hmm. But um, what he also, I think, is brilliant at is finding all of this material mm -hmm. that people have been documenting, but it has not been necessarily brought together. So I said, well, this Ha, needs to become a book. And he said, yeah, we'll do it online so that other people can actually add to it so we can always be updating it and so on. So that's where the whole digital capacity comes in, which I think is also brilliant. Mm. Sounds, sounds amazing, sounds so, so needed. I mean, the, the, partially why I mentioned Matt Powers is that, that I've been noticing that, that he's really because he's got a background in education, he has a very didactic way of um, sort of explaining pretty complex soil chemistry and and yeah. um, soil yeah. biology. And I I'm, I'm going to buy his recently um, published book on 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 soil because it, he's really done a deep dive on pulling together. Worked a lot with Elaine Ingram and and a lot of really good yeah. soil scientists. So yeah. um, I'm looking forward to experimenting with that here in the Mediterranean climate. Um, 
Yes, and they did a um, soil summit recently that Andrew was part of. And soil is key, absolutely, yeah. you know, and um, I, I've studied nutrition. I have a bachelor's in nutrition. It's one of in my interests over many years. And the whole microbiome concept is exactly uh, similar in the soil as it is in our gut. Yeah. And people are starting to understand the brain and the gut and the soil and all of the intelligence in the plant network and so on. And it's just fascinating and it, it, so inspiring. I, I had one, one conversation in this series with um, Jeremy Lint, who wrote this beautiful book, The Patterning Instinct. Um, mm -hmm. And um, he was talking about his new forthcoming book and, and how it will focus on is a notion of animate intelligence. And as he was speaking, I, I suddenly realized how deeply that notion speaks to how, how like Jung, Jung's four ways of, of, of knowing, thinking, sensing, feeling, and intuiting. Um, thinking is all this abstract knowledge that, that universities do, but sensing, feeling, and intuiting are actually about direct phenomenological embodied perception of being part of the larger transforming process that yes. you're trying to be of healing influence of to, to yes. put it in one way and so when you when you when you really sit with the notion of animate intelligence and i think that the reason i'm speaking about it i think you just talked about it with the, the relationship between the uh, gut microbiome and, and and the soil the whole Gaian network, that nested transforming wholeness is one big store of information and relationship and knowledge and insight and, and knowing how to generate health. And, and once we stop getting out of our, like without denying the head, like not getting out of our heads and not giving due recognition that that also thinking is a powerful tool and and science is a powerful tool but but really experience that direct knowing which every farmer when you when you're in relationship with a piece of land i'm already feeling it with a piece of land i'm now um a custodian of the land teaches you the land speaks to you 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 you, you the information isn't just what i can read out of a book it's it it literally jumps at you into you um and 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 that's what we need to Rekindle people. Yes. And um, we talk about an action learning spiral. Mm -hmm. So we are constantly learning, but if we trial out the learning that we're doing on a theoretical basis and trial it out in action and then evaluate whether what we learned in theory is actually coming forth in action and then revise the theory because everything is contextual and everything is changing all the time. Cambia, todo cambia, all the time. <laughs> It's always One changing. And so we need to constantly be reevaluating the things that we have learned and how it actually comes into practice in our particular context. Mm -hmm. And so then we revise our theory and then we trial that out again. And then as we go through this whole spiral of action learning, we are constantly improving our whole way of being in the world. And that's you, you've just you've just described what is at the heart of regeneration. Um, like with what you just said and what you said earlier that that the, when you said transformative action learning is at the heart of Guy, uh, Guy University's um, um, philosophy, um, the transformative bit that it all starts really with tugging on our own masks, doing the unlearning, doing the personal development, building our own capacity to, to respond, listen, understand contextual shifts and readjust re all of that and, and then building the capacity of our teams our communities our groups our immediate surroundings to do the same that that's really what what regeneration is about and i in in what we were earlier speaking about the weaving of all these beautiful expressions of regenerative culture into a larger narrative I, I sometimes feel a little bit 
sad that the, 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 the Regenesis group holding of regenerative development practice is so like while they say we're just doing our way and there are many ways and everybody can, can do it, it still feels like it is a kind of closed system that the rather than an open system. And um and I think you've been doing regeneration for, for decades uh, <laughs> and, and you've just demonstrated with, with speaking to the essence of it. Yeah. Um yeah. anyway, it's been it's been really a wonderful, wonderful 90 minutes with you and in, in, in the interest that somebody will actually press case. <laughs> somebody got to the end of it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to what you said was the best part <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway this is so lovely and and thank you for yeah also for the inspiration to to see the way that you named because before we started the recording you said there are these five things that are currently and and I, you gave me a big lesson by the first three of them actually being about tending the place from which you are then capable to be of service yes. um, and 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 to really name them as part of the important projects because otherwise it's so easy to get lost in saying oh, well I've only got these two projects and they're really eating me up and, and if you don't <laughs> value the other three that enable you that they don't eat you up uh, yes and yes. so so again thank you you, you talk thank me. you I just think this series is just so brilliant Daniel and you've always been a great supporter of Guy University and us personally and all of our projects and this whole project of regenerative culture is so important I'm so glad we've stopped talking so much about sustainability because if we sustain what we've got we're stuffed <laughs> <laughs> all the way <laughs> yeah have a, have, a, have a lovely have a lovely rest of the day in, in Mexico beautiful thank Mwah. you so much bye, bye. Mm. mucho amor te mucho quiero amor. mucho <laughs> un abrazo chao